Hi, this is Charlie Angus. I'm going to read a passage from my book, Cobalt, Cradle of the Demon Metals, Birth of a Mining Superpower. And this chapter is called The Family Business. When it comes to the financing of new resource projects, all roads lead to Toronto. Anyone serious about getting a mine developed will make their way to the office towers at the heart of the city's financial district. Every spring, mining delegations from around the world descend on the city for the annual Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada Conference, PDAC. It is the largest event of its kind in the world. The convention began in the 1930s in the ballroom of the King Edward Hotel. Today, it is a global event featuring a seamlessly endless array of booths selling everything from mining boots and helicopter services to jungle properties in Asia, Africa, South America. But it's in the hospitality suites amidst the free drinks and the high-quality cuisine that the serious schmoozing is done to sell the next El Dorado. The expansion of the Canadian mining economy from isolated northern towns to multinational colossus, is part of the mythic story of Canada's resource sector. But this powerful influence on the global stage cannot simply be explained as a Canadian financial élan. The success of the Canadian industry is rooted in the regulatory protections that were first developed during the cobalt mining boom and then were updated and expanded. So effective are those incentives that Canada has become the favoured location for the heads of international mining enterprises. 75% of the world's mining companies are now registered in Canada. The authors of the book Imperial Canada Inc. write that the Canadian mining advantage is directly related to an industry that was built from a colonial model of land exploitation. Quote, what is specifically Canadian is the fact that the practices related to the development of the mining industry, which took place under colonial conditions in Canada, have been exported abroad. Now they, the Canadian mining companies, claim for themselves wherever they go, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, or elsewhere, the same extra legal status from which they profited so outrageously in their original domestic colonial environment. Another aspect of this Canadian advantage is that the interests of Canada's mining industry have become integral to Canadian foreign policy. Mining is the family business, said John Manley, Canada's former foreign affairs minister. And the government is looking to not only export the immense skill of the resource sector, but also promote the regulatory toolbox that has made it such an immensely profitable industry in Canada. Multiple government agencies are tasked with the job of supporting the country's natural resource sector to promote this model abroad. The international outreach includes the Departments of Natural Resources Canada, Global Affairs Canada, the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development, the Canadian International Development Agency, Export Development Canada. Little wonder that with this kind of political muscle, Canada has become a superpower in the world of international resource extraction. And in addition to favorable loans and other support, government agencies are active in exporting the Canadian regulatory advantage in the global south, pushing for low taxes, lax regulatory reporting, voluntary environmental and labor standards. The Canadian template for resource extraction has been wildly profitable for the last century, and it has been promoted in developing countries now. But critics of Canada's international mining sector are accusing Canada of acting as a contemporary colonizer state by trying to export the pattern of colonization and dispossession of indigenous lands that defined the settlement of Canada. But Canadian resource companies have found themselves embroiled in some of the most politically destabilized, impoverished and corrupt regions in the world. Canadian operations in numerous jurisdictions have been accused of a staggeringly long list of crimes in the pursuit of resource profits, including violence, intimidation, and environmental devastation. The social conflict that existed in the early days of cobalt has been magnified a thousand times in frontiers where the rule of law is compromised and excursions into indigenous territories are magnified. A recent report from the Osgoode Law School entitled The Canadian Brand, Violence and Canadian Mining in Latin America documented 44 murders, 403 injuries, and more than 700 cases where indigenous and local opposition was targeted for suppression in struggles over Canadian mining projects.
The violence took place in more than 13 countries in Latin America. Similar disturbing allegations have been made against Canadian companies in other jurisdictions. Canadian companies have been accused of massive environmental damage in the Philippines, of rape, murder, and dispossession in Africa. In Mexico, the Canadian embassy was accused of complicity in the cover-up of the murder of a local activist fighting against the development of a Canadian mine. And two renowned Canadian mining companies, Barrick and Hut Bay Metals, have faced disturbing allegations of sexual violence at their international operations. In 2011, a group of 11 Guatemalan women launched a court case in Toronto accusing Canadian company Hut Bay of being complicit in a campaign of sexual terror waged by corporate forces. The women aged between 14 and 80 alleged that the gang rapes were intended to force them from their land. Now, Hud Bay is not a small rogue company. It traces its roots to the most illustrious legends of cobalt and the Canadian mining industry. Now, prior to this, no cases of international abuse by Canadian miners have ever been successfully fought in a Canadian courtroom. CBC's The National has described the case as a veritable, quote, shockwave through the glass and steel corridors of corporate Canada. Not because serious allegations were made against a venerable Canadian mining company, but because of the possibility that a Canadian court might actually hold a Canadian mining company accountable. And that precedent would be set for the entire industry. The practice of rape as a corporate tool to break Indigenous resistance on the land has a long and dark history in this so-called settlement of frontier. In the final report of the National Inquiry into the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, the MMIWG, released in June of 2019, an entire chapter was dedicated to the problem of sexual violence connected to industrial mining and oil and gas operations in northern Canada. The commissioners of the report quoted representatives of the Lubicon Cree on the relationship between the rape of natural resources and the rape of Indigenous women. Quote, The industrial system of resource extraction in Canada is predicated on the raping and pillaging of Mother Earth as well as violence against women. These two are inextricably linked. With the expansion of extractive industries, not only do we see the desecration of land, we see an increase in violence against women. Rampant sexual violence against women and a variety of social ills result from the influx of transient workers in and around the workers' camps. Sexual violence tied to modern mining in the global south or resource man camps in the far north has received very little attention in the Canadian media. However, Micmac academic and lawyer Dr. Pamela Palmatier draws a direct link between modern corporate sexual violence and much older settler myths. She says, quote, the rape of indigenous lands and bodies is being carried out by corporate conquistadors. When it comes to allegations against Canadian mining in the global south, industry representatives are adamant that Canadian companies operate to the highest ethical and social standards, pointing to their self-monitoring corporate social responsibility commitments. Many Canadian companies do work in these locations without conflict. But Canada's reputation continues to be tarnished by allegations that Canadian officials are turning a blind eye to corporate abuse. The Canadian government has tried to smooth over relations between the mining industry and the global south through the use of international aid money and charities. The Canadian International Development Agency has committed to building support for the mining sector by promoting social projects near Canadian mines. Canada has crafted mining regulations and tax policies in multiple jurisdictions from Colombia to New Guinea to Zambia. But according to Alan Denon and William Shacker, these so-called good governance policies have established similar tax rates and exemptions to those in Ontario and Quebec. So conventional wisdom would tell us that implementing a similar tax regime between Canada and the Global South will, quote, lift all boats and provide a higher quality of life for people where the resources are being extracted. But the statistics for development from resource exploitation in the Global South remain very mixed. Well, the Washington World Resources Institute states that, quote, two-thirds of the people living below poverty reside in nations rich with extractive resources, yet they rarely receive any meaningful benefits from their country's resource wealth. 
Although many countries in the global south have signed on to the low tax regime being promoted by Canada, many others have fought for a much larger share of their wealth. And like the early struggles in COBOL, dynamic debate is raging in many developing countries about who should benefit from the wealth of the earth. The fight of some nations to get a fair share of their resource revenue has meant that Canadian resource companies are paying much higher taxes abroad in some jurisdictions than they do in Canada. The Narwhal reports that Barrick pays $503 in royalties for every ounce of gold it mines in the Dominican Republic, but only $73 per ounce in Canada. Chevron pays seven times the tax on oil projects in Indonesia as they do in Canada. The UK Guardian explains this disparity as indicative that Canada is a, quote, tax haven for resource giants. And the fact that there are jurisdictions in the global south with much higher tax rates and they remain profitable centers for Canadian investment raises fundamental questions about the role the economic hinterland model is being promoted both in Canada and abroad. Because despite the immense pressure of the Canadian industry and foreign policy, there are countries that have rejected the regulatory toolbox that was developed in the land of the demon metals. And this reminds us that the assumptions about who owns the wealth of the earth and how that wealth should be developed are far from settled.